Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler, a Harvard-educated, internationally recognized expert in the fields of testosterone therapy, prostate cancer, and male sexuality. Dr. Morgenthaler, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us today. It is a privilege to have this opportunity. Oh, that's very kind of you. It's great to be with you. So when doing research on you and your background um, uh -oh. and your area of expertise, I have to say my interest was quite piqued, so to speak, <laughs> and uh, pun intended. <laughs> um, so if you can help uh, enlighten myself as well as the audience as to some of the issues that surround your focus of men's health. I know that um, you are accredited with founding the Men's Health of Boston, which is the first men's health center in the United States focusing on sexual, reproductive, and hormonal health for men. So can you just share with us first your background, but then what was the catalyst to initiate that endeavor? Sure. Well, thank you for that question. So um, it's kind of amazing looking back at all the stuff I've done and where it all started from. So I grew up in Montreal, Canada, and I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. And uh, I was a little bit lost as an undergraduate first year. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was going to be a professional hockey player coming from Canada, but I found out quickly that people were way bigger than me and faster and stronger. And so as a freshman, I, had, I played freshman hockey, but then I needed for to... For Harvard. For Harvard. Wow. But then I needed to do something else. And uh, I ended up in a laboratory of a, a gentleman named David Cruz, professor. Um, and he had a reptile lab and it was fantastic and I was a biology major and he had snakes and lizards and I ended up spending three years there all my free time weekends summers and uh, the work with the lizards changed my life and set my career and specifically we were interested in the sexual behavior of these lizards so this is the American chameleon Anolis carolinensis it lives in Florida I'm sure you've seen them. They're about three, four inches long. And uh, they're these little guys that run up the trees on your banisters and whatever else. They get on your walls of the hotels. And if you put a male in the, in the cage with a female, it's got this bright colored flap of skin that comes out. It's called a dewlap. And so the dewlap comes out, and the head of the male goes up and down really quickly, like the male's going, yeah, 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 yeah. Whether or not the female is around? No, so the female oh. is the object of okay. this desire and this okay. behavior. And if the female's hormones are okay, she does a very elegant little push-up, and then the male comes closer, the dewlap comes up, yeah, 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 and they mate. It's an amazing thing to watch. And if you remove the testicles of the lizard, and I didn't know I was going to medical school or going to be a urologist. And, uh, but urologists remove testicles of humans sometimes for one reason or another, cancer, trauma, et cetera. But, um, so I removed <laughs> these little lizards. And the testicles are the source of testosterone. And that's what drives sexuality. And so if you had a castrated male and you put it in the cage with the female, they didn't do anything. And then we'd mapped where in the brain testosterone was taken up by these lizards and my project was to take tiny amounts of testosterone put it in those portions of the brain basically microsurgery micro neurosurgery and if I were successful those males would go in the cage with the female they had no circulating testosterone they'd see the female the dewlap would come out yeah 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 and they would mate again it was amazing fascinating and what I got out of it was that testosterone was a brain hormone, that it was critical for regulating, necessary and sufficient, we like to say, for the entire range of behavior in the male lizard. Then I didn't really do much with testosterone. I went to medical school. I went through residency six years. And when I came out of residency as a urologist, I started specializing in male fertility issues and sexuality. And we didn't have a lot to treat these guys with. There was no Viagra, Cialis back then. This is the late 1980s. 
And I just wondered from my experience with lizards, maybe men were like them. And In more it, ways than one, I'm sure. But. <laughs> either a snake or a reptile, right? And so here's the thing. So it turned out that they were. I was shocked at how many men had low levels of testosterone. No one had ever prepared me for that. And I started treating them just to see what would happen. In the late 1980s, early 1990s, nobody was getting treated with testosterone. Just a few very rare, very special, severe cases. Men who had pituitary tumors, rare. Uh, men who'd lost both their testicles to cancer, trauma, rare. But the idea that you could just have a regular looking, more or less healthy guy who has symptoms of less sex drive, erection's not so good, not feeling his mojo anymore, his motivation is down, maybe a little depressed. The idea that that man might have low levels of testosterone and might respond to treatment just wasn't known, wasn't appreciated. And so I started treating these guys and they had responded beautifully. And that really set me on a, the rest of my career for the next, whatever it is now, 30 plus years. So would you say that you've actually pioneered the modern use of testosterone in men to you know, regulate these, this issue? You know, whenever somebody says, I was the first to do this, the only one, you always find out there was somebody else who was doing it. But here's what, here's what I did do. So um, I started accumulating cases and started solving some of the problems. So the biggest concern about testosterone back when I started was the fear that it caused prostate cancer. In fact, testosterone was first synthesized and used in the 1930s, 1930s. There's an article by a Dr. Aub, A-U-B, in the New England Journal of Medicine extolling the virtues of testosterone that goes back to 1940. Amazing. And Dr. Aub in that New England Journal article says all the things about what testosterone did for men that we now say today. It's as if we've rediscovered the wheel. But here's what happened in 1941, a year later, came a paper by a, a fellow named Huggins who later won the Nobel Prize, where he associated prostate cancer with testosterone. And he specifically wrote, testosterone injections activate prostate cancer. And that was the end of it. And for the next 50, 60 years, everybody was terrified about testosterone. So the work that I did, if, if I can take um, some of the credit for bringing testosterone into the modern era, was work around this prostate cancer question. I was taught, like everybody else, that it was bad. And what, and what I learned was that high levels of testosterone were supposed to cause cancer, and low levels were supposed to be protective. Like a man with low testosterone, I was taught, and I taught my own residents and medical students, you're supposed to never get prostate cancer. So when I started seeing good results in my men, I was very nervous I was going to do something bad to them. And to just be cautious and safe, I said to a few of them at the beginning, I said, we better do a biopsy of your prostate. Before you put them on. Before we put you on testosterone, because God forbid you have some cancer hiding in there. This might be like you know, what we learned, pouring gasoline on a fire, feeding a hungry tumor. Now remember that those men were supposed to never get prostate cancer because their levels were low. And right away we started seeing cancer, and we ended up publishing what I think is really the first important article in sort of unraveling this uh, incorrect information. We published it in the Journal of the American Medical Association, 1996, 20 years ago, more that these men, we had 77 men with low testosterone and no evidence of prostate cancer, normal blood test PSA, and 11 out of the 77 had cancer. That was 14, 15%. Well, those were astronomical numbers back then, and it didn't make any sense. So if the part of the story where low testosterone wasn't protective, and it clearly wasn't, if that wasn't true, then maybe the rest of the story wasn't so true. And bit by bit now in my practice, we've given testosterone to more and more men who might be at risk of prostate cancer. And eventually, now we give it to men with active prostate cancer if, if they need it and they're symptomatic and they understand that there may be some risks. Yeah.
So more recently, though, you've been a key leading scientific figure in the global discussion regarding cardiovascular risks in, in the, with the use of testosterone. Can you expand on that? You know, we started off and everything was all funny, and, and here we're talking we'll about, that, talk, uh, we'll talking that. about we'll, the serious uh, lighten things up a little bit. So listen, but, but, here, but the question is important about cardiovascular risks, and we do have to deal with this, and this is a serious topic. So what people don't get about testosterone, well, maybe your viewers do, but what the outside world doesn't is they think of it as this very controversial issue. Like, oh my God, like why can't people just get old naturally without the help of anything? And Who would want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Like we have this magical idea, I don't know if you remember, what's her name, uh, Catherine Hepburn on, mm. on, on Golden Pond, right? This idea of we're all going to go off into the, the sunset. Into the sunset. <laughs> And the truth is, is that aging is awful. It stinks, right? We get bad eyesight, bad teeth. I don't bad, know what you're talking about. <laughs> bad joints, bad hearts. We get cancer. Those are all age associated. We treat all of them. So levels of testosterone in men and also in women decline as we get older. And if we can show that the benefits outweigh the risks, why don't we treat that? And that's exactly where we are. So in terms of the cardiovascular story, that was an amazing story. So for about 20 years, all the evidence was that having a good testosterone was good for the heart. Good for the heart. Men with low testosterone were shown in study after study to have higher risk of dying and getting heart attacks and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, November 2013, an article appears in the literature in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The first author is Vegan, V-I-G-E-N, and boom! It says testosterone is associated with heart attacks, strokes, and death. Major headlines in every news outlet, every media outlet. FDA ends up having a meeting. It's well publicized. And what had happened is that this controversial topic of testosterone, which some people say, you know, why we have to do it. The drug companies are just, you know, foisting these unnecessary drugs on us. All of a sudden, it was like the story was, you see, these guys who couldn't just handle getting older, they need this drug and now we find out it's dangerous for them. Ha! Right? Like there's this superior tone to these editorials that came out. But here's the thing, that study was a terrible study. So it wasn't, you know, we like to have these randomized controlled trials, right? We have two groups, you give them the same thing, or one gets the drug, or one gets a placebo. Let's see what happens over time. But this was what's called an observational study. So they looked back at a database of individuals, and some of those men had received testosterone, some not. And what they reported that made all the headlines was that the actual number of men who had more heart attack strokes and deaths was higher than the group that didn't. That wasn't true. Can I tell you a little story about sure. it? Sure. So when the article came out, uh, they give all the numbers that you need to know. How many people died in this group? How many people had a heart attack? How many people had a stroke? And I added them all up. And you divide by the number of people in that group. And then you compare it to the other one. And their numbers didn't make sense. They weren't the right numbers. Clearly, they didn't go to Harvard. <laughs> well, I'm sure they're fine individuals, and they went to yeah. great schools. But me and a few of my colleagues around the world were all emailing, like, hey, the numbers don't make sense. They make sense to you. They don't make sense to me. And somebody, one of my colleagues said, somebody has to call the editor. So I said, okay, I'll call. So I ended up calling the editor of JAMA, very nice individual. And we talked for a little while. And I said, can I show you the numbers? On the, in the abstract, he said, sure, I've got it right here. And I said, listen, if you add this up, the testosterone group had fewer of these events by half than the group that didn't get testosterone. And you're reporting the opposite. And there's dead silence on the phone. And I say, your authors made a mistake. Did they do a retraction? I said, your reviewers mm -hmm. missed it. They had an editorial. I said, the editorialist missed it. I said, JAMA has reported this, and you have a responsibility to correct the record. And again, there's dead silence on the phone. And after a moment, he says, it's not a hard calculation. He says, I can't disagree with anything you said. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to get, 
contact the authors, I'll get back to you. Within a week, they had revised the article, but didn't tell anybody they'd revised it. So it didn't make the news, it wasn't on all the Nobody news Nobody picked right. it up, and it was an error, and they came up with this very statistical kind of way of using the same numbers, but it wasn't right. And then later, a few months later, they report another mistake, which was that almost 10% of this all-male population turned out to be female. Oh my goodness. So this is not something that you can hang your hat on. And I was one of a group of people that tried to get JAMA to actually retract that article because the data were no longer reliable. They didn't, but this is not, this was the article that started the cardiovascular concern, and it's not a credible article. And since then, we just, my colleagues and I just published a paper within the last year. We've reviewed everything since that's been published, and there's not a single paper that shows increased cardiovascular risk, and there are multiple papers that show benefits. Men who take testosterone have lower risk of dying, heart attacks, strokes. What symptoms or signs uh, that a man would be experiencing would be um, indicative for him to discuss it with his clinician? And additionally, um, how would you determine whether or not that man was a candidate for, for testosterone replacement? Yeah, the most common thing that brings a guy to the doctor is usually sexual symptoms. And so there are a few of them. And I like to break it up into sexual symptoms, non-sexual symptoms. On the sexual side, it's usually the desire just is reduced. Like, it's not normal for a guy to not want to have sex. And so even, uh, and even if he just wants it once in a month or so, right. that's not normal for guys. There's usually something that's going on. Can be depression, can be interpersonal stuff, but by and large, it's not right. So low libido, we call that. Sometimes erections are more difficult to get or to, or to maintain. Uh, the orgasm can be sometimes difficult to achieve and can feel less like fireworks. So those are the sexual symptoms. The other symptoms tend to be outside of sex, fatigue, lack of pep. I had a guy in my office yesterday who says, I'm like the busiest guy in the world. You know, I'm always doing a bunch of things. I've got a workshop. You know, I've got, I'm in a bowling league. And last year or so, I just want to hang out at home and just watch TV. It's not me. It's not me. I don't know where my motivation went. I don't know what's going on. That's a common story. More and more now we hear about guys who at the gym, they just can't make progress. A lot of guys, you know, now we're in the workout era for the last 20 years or so. Guys know what, it, and nobody does it continuously. We, we, something happens, we take a break, but guys know that when they go to the gym and they haven't been there for a while, it takes a while to build up, but they're going to build up and they know the pace that that happens. If I can do 10 push-ups today, in a week or so maybe I can do 12 or 14, and it goes on like that. And the guys say, I can't, I'm not making any progress, I can't. Or they notice that they're dieting and they're trying to sort of, you know, stay fit and they can't lose like this tie around their middle. So those are some of what goes on. To me though, there's a couple of pieces that are really important. So one is how a man feels in general. We're talking about quality of life. Mainstream medicine has messed up, maybe that's too strong a term, what they've overlooked is the kind of health that people have when they're not deathly sick. Meaning the focus has been on important things, right? Cancer, heart attacks, all that. But most of us aren't walking around right now, even if we've had some of those things. We care about how we live. We care about how we interact with our partner, with our friends, with our children, our work performance. They're things that give us pleasure. Overall with, quality of life. Yeah, pleasure, like hobbies, athletics, whatever it is. And when men have low levels of testosterone, they lose a key part of themselves. And some guys will say, I've lost my mojo. Or I had one guy that gave, said it really nicely. He says, you know, doctor, before you put me on testosterone, I got through my day fine, but I was feeling like I saw the world in black and white. And now that I've been on testosterone for a few months with you, like the world's in living color again. It's a nice way to say it. So what about stress and depression? I mean, what if your patient has that as their issue and it's not necessarily low testosterone? Sure, and that can happen. I mean, so listen, stress happens, depression happens, and the symptoms of interesting with mood and depression and testosterone, the symptoms of depression 
can mimic the symptoms of low testosterone and vice versa. So sometimes we have to try and tease those apart. It gets even more confusing because low levels of testosterone can cause depressed depression. mood. Okay. So and fix depression lowers testosterone. So these guys are intertwined. For the most part, in a practice that most physicians who might listen to this podcast would have, we make a distinction. So there, people can have like a depressed mood or blunted mood, but if somebody really is feeling like their life isn't worth living, they're worried about, you know, they have thoughts about hurting themselves or hurting others, helpless, hopeless, worthless, that's probably not testosterone, that's acute major depression, and they need to be treated appropriately probably with antidepressants. But for somebody who says, you know, I'm just not enjoying things the way I used to, oh, and my sex drive is down, oh. So in regard to testing for low testosterone, is total testosterone the appropriate test, or is there something else that would be more effective? We've always been taught that total testosterone is the test, and it's just not true. So um, testosterone comes really in three forms in the bloodstream, all of which form the total testosterone. A big fraction of it is bound to this carrier molecule called SHBG, or sex hormone binding globulin. And the characteristic of that binding is that it's so tight that the testosterone molecule can't come off and can't go into the cells where it needs to go. The two other part, and so that part is not biologically available. The two other parts are free, which means it's not attached to anything, and another part that's weakly bound to some of these pr proteins, and it's available. It turns out that there's now excellent data that free testosterone, you can also use bioavailable, but free testosterone is, corresponds much more closely with symptoms and how a guy's doing and with treatment than with the total testosterone. And the reason is, is that there's a lot of variation from person to person with that carrier molecule SHBG, which sponges up all the testosterone. And we just published a paper a year ago that the variation from individual to individual is huge. And so even in the normal range, which is normally 20 to 60, even if you just go from normal low to normal top, you've reduced the active part of testosterone by about half. So does time of day come into play as to when you would administer the test to give a more accurate reading? Oh my God, it's so exciting that you asked me that question. Oh, How, not Hot. too exciting, I hope. <laughs> Hot off the press. Okay. So again, there's been this idea, like you're asking all the key questions about like how should you test. Traditionally, we test for testosterone in the morning. Why? Well, the argument has been levels are highest in the morning. Okay, I never really understood why that's a good reason to do it. You know, if you want to test if somebody's heart's okay, you don't do their EKG while they're lying flat. You might do it for other reasons, but actually you stress them. So you put them on a treadmill and you see if any kind of heart disease shows up, ischemic heart disease. So why should we test testosterone at a time of day when it's the best? What that ends up meaning is that there are some people who in the morning may have what looks like a normal testosterone, but for the rest of the day their levels are in the pits and they really are symptomatic and they really might benefit from treatment. What's exciting is we have data, we're just presenting at a meeting in a few weeks, uh, where we looked at the, what's called the diurnal variation in testosterone, like the daily changes. So we had these men and we got their blood at several time points, 8 a.m., 11 a.m., 2 p.m., 5 p.m., 8 o'clock at night, and then we let them go home and they come back the next morning. And it turns out that for men who have normal levels of testosterone, they do have that diurnal variation we've been talking about, highest levels in the morning, drops in the afternoon. But not by much, but it drops. For the men who started with low testosterone, there was no change at all. So other than improvement in overall sexual health, and we discussed the cardiovascular benefits of it, what are some of the other potential benefits that utilizing testosterone therapy will offer a patient? The most important thing about testosterone for somebody who's deficient is they feel better. And that affects the entire body. It affects everything. So we now have evidence testosterone actually helps people lose weight. Uh, it, it decreases fat mass, increases lean mass. This is good for health, right? Uh, improves bone density, very important, especially as we get on, you know, so we avoid fractures. 
Uh, there's some evidence that it may reduce some of the inflammatory markers that have to do with heart disease. And um, we now have some large studies. There was one out of Canada that looked at something on the order of 30,000 men over a long period of time. Observational, not a randomized trial, but observational data that the longer men were on testosterone, the lower their risk of heart attack and stroke, and get this, the lower the risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. Wow. So a lot of the old ideas turned out to be completely wrong. Some of the stuff that grabbed the attention of the media and sort of the hardcore, like skeptics, I don't believe in any of that anti-aging stuff, it turns out to just be wrong. So are there various forms of which this testosterone is available for men, and what, what are they? And what do you prefer to prescribe? It's interesting. We have a whole bunch of different ways to give testosterone. We still don't have a great pill. Some pills are some of the oldest forms of testosterone that are around, but they, the ones that are approved in the United States are methylated and they can cause some liver damage. So we don't use those. There's a couple of new pills that are in the pipeline for the FDA, still not approved yet in the United States, but approved outside of the United States. In my practice, we use, we're not so keen on the, we use less of the topical gels or creams. They're okay but about 15% of people don't absorb them well. So it means a lot of blood tests and a lot of changing doses. So that differs for women then, utilizing testosterone therapy. So the thing about women, women also benefit from testosterone, as you know, but they don't need nearly as much. So that's why a topical so if, would if be If the okay. absorption yeah. isn't as good for a woman, it's probably still okay. But we can still, we still follow women and monitor how it is that they're feeling and we can check their levels too. So, um, you know, in my practice, we tend to emphasize more of the pellets and more of the injections. But if somebody wants a topical, and there's now also a nasal gel, that's fine too. We'll work with what, whatever seems right for the guy. And what period of time would you start to notice the benefits of it? Measurable benefits. Yeah, so it, this is really interesting. If somebody's never been on testosterone, a lot of these people don't notice anything for a month even though their levels are, are in the good range the next day after treatment. If somebody's been on testosterone. And they went off. And they went off it for whatever reason, their prescription ran out, whatever. They can notice it sometimes within a day, sometimes to the minute. Yeah. They can feel when it kicks in. What's the difference? The difference partly is, is that how we feel when we feel good is subtle. We all have good days and bad days. We can have good hours and bad hours in the same day, right? Where I feel exhausted. Oh, no, I'm ready to take on this project. Oh, no, I'm exhausted again. And, but there's a characteristic way that testosterone makes us feel better. And like there's just sort of like being, instead of being back on your heels, like back, back in front now on the front of on your, um, what's that part of your feet? The balls of your feet. Okay. <laughs> and, and people <laughs> You've used that one before. <laughs> and people get it. They right. say, oh my God, it's kicking in. So it's not just that it takes longer for things to rise than it does to fall. Right. So, okay. So um, we've talked about the risk, or should I say we've, we've, we've dispelled the myth of the risk of prostate cancer. Um, and I know this is not necessarily your field of expertise, but you are a urologist, and this has nothing to do with testosterone. I just have a fascination with this question. Testicular cancer. Is there an association between testicular cancer and putting um, where, which pocket a man puts his cell phone in? Oh my God, I never heard that before. Is that like, the, is that like a thing now? Here's, I'm gonna, I I'm know some young 20-somethings who have been diagnosed with testicular cancer and in the same side of which they keep their cell phone. And they are convinced because there's no familial history or any other issues medically yeah. going on. So That's really interesting. So I have to tell you, my, my suspicion is there was a 50-50 chance left versus right, that, there'd be a, that that association would show up for those guys. So I don't know. Testis cancer is a, um, you know, it's an uncommon cancer, but in the age group 18 to 35, it's the number one cancer uh, in, young, in men. 
and it's real and it's, it shows up as a lump like or a heaviness in the, in the testicle. Guys are supposed to do testicular self exams just the way women are supposed to do breast exams. It's not related to testosterone. People don't know what causes it. There's not usually a family history that goes along with it. Our main risk factor we know about is men with undescended testicles. So if a man was born with an undescended testicle and maybe with surgery it was brought down, usually young in life, those guys are at an increased risk of somewhere between four and tenfold. So sometimes that's a risk, but there are a lot of guys who have no risk factors and they get it. Everybody's worried about radiation and mag you know, magnetic yeah, stuff right. these days. And so, you know, I don't think it's been studied well enough. I've certainly seen nothing about that. Um, but sometimes it's just bad luck. <laughs> Okay. Um, if I can add one thing, yeah, it's sure. one of the most so testis cancer or testicular cancer um, is not a death knell. Right. It's actually one of the great success stories in oncology over the last fifty years. It's now rare, happens unfortunately, but rare for a man diagnosed with testis cancer to die. These men get treated successfully, sometimes with chemotherapy, sometimes radiation, sometimes surgery, and by and large. Those men go on and live a completely normal life. Do those men have a reduction in testosterone? They do. So, right. Do you so, put them on? Well, it depends hormones. if they okay. need it. You know, so testosterone is made by the testicles. Men essentially have a two-cylinder engine, and if you remove one of the cylinders, they may have a little bit less oomph. When they're young, it probably doesn't matter, but they're more vulnerable to having low testosterone when they're older. Thank you for your candidness on that one. Can I tell you some really exciting sure. stuff we're doing with prostate cancer? Sure. Yeah. So, um, as you know, uh, the fear has been that testosterone would make prostate cancer grow like pouring gasoline on a fire. And gradually over the years, we've started treating men who seemed to be at high risk for prostate cancer but didn't have it. Then we started treating, my, me and my group, men who were already treated for their cancer and appeared to be cured without any bad things happening to them. And then we started treating men who are on what we call active surveillance, which means they've got low-grade cancer but they haven't been treated. They don't want to be treated until um, something shows up that's more worrisome. But they've got cancer. And so some years ago, I started treating these guys. And it's amazing where this has taken us. I just want to tell you one quick story. An 84-year-old guy got me started with this. He's an attorney. He came in to see me. He had trouble with erections, couldn't have an orgasm. He was married, and he wanted help. And I said, you know, from your symptoms, I think you have low testosterone. And if you do... He's 84. 84. And if you do... But he was a good 84. If you do, testosterone might help you. So we got blood tests, and his testosterone was indeed low, but his PSA was high. Hmm. And I had a conversation with him. You know, I don't do a lot of prostate biopsies in men in their 80s, but, you know, if he had an aggressive cancer, maybe we should know. He says, I want to find out. So we do his biopsy, and he does have cancer, not a particularly aggressive kind. And we have a conversation about his prostate cancer, and he says, I don't want it to be treated for my prostate cancer. I just want you to follow me. I say, great. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I'll see you back in a few months. And I'm ready to leave. And he says, but doctor, what about the testosterone? I said, well, you've got prostate cancer. He says, yeah. You said it would help me. I said, well, I, didn't, I don't know they'll help you. I think it might help you, but I've never treated anybody like you. You have untreated prostate cancer. And he was very smart. He went to the office every day still as an attorney. He said, doctor, if you give me testosterone and it makes my cancer grow, will the PSA go up? I say, that's very logical. I think so, but I don't know because I've never treated anybody like you. He says, if the PSA goes up because of testosterone and we stop it, won't the PSA go down? I say, that's very logical, but I don't know. I've never treated anybody like you. He said, doctor, I'm 84 years old. I've got to go sometime. I'd rather go on testosterone. <laughs> he says, but I'd like to try it. Right. And I'll sign anything wow. you want. We treated him. Now, here's what happened. His PSA went from, I believe, 8 down to 7, down to 6, down to Remarkable. 5. And at two years, his PSA was lower than it had been when we started. I wrote him up as two years of testosterone treatment in a man with untreated prostate cancer. And he was my patient on testosterone until he was 90, six years later, when unfortunately his wife brought him in. He had dementia. 
and she was basically stopping these treatments. But he got great results out of that. That was probably about 10, 12 years ago. And since then, we've now treated about 50 men on active surveillance with testosterone without any bad things happening. About a year or two ago, two years ago, a man came in who wasn't 84, but 94. And he had metastatic prostate cancer. He had an aggressive kind of cancer. It was all through his bones. His PSA was in the 500s. My goodness. He had two obstructed kidneys, so he had a bag of urine, and, and he came in to see me. One bag in one pocket, one bag in the other of his nice tweed jacket. He was totally with it mentally. And he said, I'd like testosterone. How I old said, was his girlfriend? <laughs> so his wife had died. His wife, oh my goodness. I said, what? He came in with his daughter, who was okay. a nurse practitioner in her 60s. I said, why do you want testosterone? And he says, I used to exercise every day, and I can't do it anymore. I'm too tired. And I feel like my brain isn't so sharp. He was a scientist. He had something on the order of 100 patents. He seemed pretty sharp to me. But what he described is something that younger guys talk about, too, like this brain fog. So he, and I told him the story of the 84-year-old guy. He says, how old was he, 84? I'm 94. He says, I've never been afraid, because I told him, your cancer, you've got, I've never treated anybody like you, sir. Now he had metastatic disease. And we worry about the spinal column getting involved with these bone metastases and people getting paralyzed. Super rare, but it happens. You could die very soon. He says, I've never lived my life in fear, and I don't want to do it now. I'd like you to treat me, if you will. So we treated him, and he lived for another 10 months. He sent me a beautiful picture, his daughter did actually, at seven months, he's sitting in the waiting room of the dentist's office. He's got a cane and he's looking fit as a fiddle, happy. And what happened to him is that one of his tubes came out for the nephrostomy tube that drained the kidney and he got infected and he never quite recovered. Now, did he die of prostate cancer? Did he die of that? I don't know, there's no question his cancer was going to continue to do whatever his cancer was doing. But he had a great 10 months of life. And I forgot to mention, he started exercising and he started corresponding again with all his colleagues from around the world. So the question is, if I can make it a little bit bigger, what are we here for? Like, what are we on this planet for? And without getting into religion or too deep philosophy, to some extent we're here and there are things that motivate us and make us feel like we are engaged, we are vital, we are part of this world. And it may be something different for you than it is for me or for somebody else. But when the hormones are off, sometimes that's just we lose that. We lose who we are. And what this gentleman was telling me, I've heard time and time again from these men with prostate cancer, which is, doctor, I don't care if I live longer this way, I'll accept living shorter Just if, I can, happy. if I can be there again, happy, engaged, alive, doing what I like to do, enjoying life. So we now treat um, a number of men with very advanced prostate cancer based on that 94-year-old guy. And uh, for some, I'm not saying that it's a treatment for their cancer, but it's a treatment for the person as an entire human being. And I'm proud of the work that we're doing, and I think it's a different option that we haven't really thought about very much. So on that note, um, you know, th these patients who have died happy, what would you hope that your legacy would be? You know, when I was um, starting out my career, what I really wanted was one sentence that referred to my scientific work in a textbook somewhere. And really what's happened is, is that we have a whole new world where people appreciate now the importance of having normal levels of hormones and what it means to their life, their enjoyment, their relationships, their sexuality, and it's true for men, and I don't do really any, any work with women, but it's also true for women, like we've gotten there. And at the end of the day, 
uh, I'd like to think that I made some contribution in bringing down the barriers to understanding that this might be okay and to showing people by publishing all the little different things that we've done over the years in my practice how to do this right and how to help men live a full and satisfying life. And it's not just for them, but it's for their partner. Absolutely. And oftentimes it's the partner that feels that it's, it's her is you know, the issue and my husband must be seeking, else, seeking it elsewhere oh or what have God, you. Yeah. When oftentimes it's the, you know, their, their partner is just having these issues. Uh, you know, to lighten things up a little bit, um, you wrote a book recently. It back in, what, what year was that, 2000 and... It's about three years ago, four okay. years ago. So you authored this book, um, Why Men Fake It. Yeah. was the primary title <laughs> of that. And I was stunned to hear that men could actually fake it and I get away, know. away with that. I know. So just the short answer, for lack of a better word, um, as to what, you know, what... Does that mean exactly? And so it turns out that not only do women fake orgasms, men fake them. And when this guy first came to see me, and that's where the title of the book came from, was this first case I saw, and I've seen others since. This young guy comes in, and everything is normal about him. But he can't have an orgasm while he's having sex with a girlfriend. He can do it on his own. And when he started, and he didn't care particularly for these girlfriends, who was just like one night stands, he thought he was like the Energizer Bunny and he is Mr. Studley, right? Because he could just keep going. But then what happened is, oh my goodness, he fell in love. And just like you say, the woman is a key part of all these things, certainly for heterosexual couples, right? And his girlfriend that he now loved thought it was weird, number one, that he couldn't come during sex with her. And number two, she thought it was something bad about her. She wasn't sexy enough, she wasn't doing it right. And so he started faking it so that she would feel better about herself. It was kind of noble in a bizarre way. So he got too wrapped up with it social, psychologically that he was trying so hard to please her that it was becoming he thought frustration? He, need, he thought he needed to pretend that he'd had an orgasm so that she would feel like she did a good job sexually. And but you, physiologically, I still don't understand that. Ah, uh, yeah. It's great, because everybody says, how do they fake it? What happens to the fluid? Right. So the answer is, it's, it's actually, it's not as big a mystery as you might think. So first of all, he says, that I, and I asked the same question. So they wore a condom at the beginning, and he would just make sure that he would run off and flush it down the toilet before she could see anything, whether it was empty or had anything in it. And they says, later we gave up the condom when we became, you know, exclusive. And he says, you know, there's a lot of fluid down there. I just assume that she doesn't notice. Now, I've had women tell me, oh, I would notice. But every woman's a little different. So whether she really knew or not, we don't know. For more information on that, they should just go buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I just want to thank you for um, increasing our knowledge on all of this and the awareness. and. Um, we will definitely have to do a part two. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for all of your work. You are changing lives and changing the um, paradigm on, on the use of testosterone. Thank you so much. So, thank you.